Our first speaker, our plenary today, is Charvel Parmat from Stanford. And I don't want to eat too much into his time, so I'm just going to let him take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I have to say that I was prepared walking my way here on saying a few things. And then when you told me I'm going to be videotaped, I'm going to say different things. <laughs> <laughs> so we can have a conversation afterwards. Uh, this is really the re it's a compilation of some work that we have done that uh, many, many students uh, have really contributed to this. And uh, we're putting it now to define a framework for digital twins. So this is a little bit what I'm going to talk about and also in the backdrop of physics-informed machine learning. So I live in the Bay Area, where if you haven't heard of AI, machine learning, big data, IoT, cyber physical system, industry 4.0, I mean, it looks like you've been sleeping all the time. Uh, now, hearing about it is one thing. Understanding really what is new in it is a different story. Uh, so I like to see all this from an engineering perspective and what we can do to engineering is that this is ushering an era of customized decision. And I'll tell you what I mean by customized decision. And this is going to, to bring me to uh, <coughs> digital twins. Now, digital twins, it's an old concept by today's standards of the, what is new and what is old. It easily goes roughly about a decade. This is the earliest paper that I could trace that has coined you know, the word digital twins. But I was told that they were in Europe, probably earlier paper that talks about it. But anyway, this is a paper that I find interesting. It comes from Eric Tugel and a number of other people at AFRL and some collaborators in Graphia at Cornell in 2011. So it's a it's a digital replica of either a physical asset, which is primarily what we would be interested in, but also it could be a digital replica of a process, like certification or anything like that. And uh, its significance is that pretty much you can simulate anything you want to reproduce the state and the behavior of the system that you're interested in. Now, what the whole talk is going to be about, at least at the beginning, is how you simulate these states because there are as many ideas as the number of people who are working on it plus two. Now, the characterization in that paper from 2011, it was kind of foreseeing that by 2025, we should be able to solve trillions of degrees of freedom, to have a model that is nonlinear, ultra realistic geometric details, multi scale, fluid structure, you can read the list. Essentially, you can throw the kitchen tank at the whole thing, and you want it. All the stuff to really be informed by sensors and kind of reproduce the states once you update it from sensor information. No one really said how you would do it. But there was a paragraph at the end that says, well, it's ambitious, but if you achieve even 1% of this, that's already great, uh, a great achievement. We certainly all agree with this. I mean, I don't know about all, but I certainly agree with this. Now, later on, quickly, a perceived enabler came in as machine learning, software analytics, data, centric systems, all the buzzwords, you know, that make lots of people happy these days. But again, not very clear how this would happen. Now, there's a lot of behavior, in my opinion, that is similar to startups, you know, the, what is called the fear of missing out, the female. I mean, that's a lot of it that permeating right now almost everything. And so, real-time processing was clearly identified as something that is needed. So let's move fast forward now. We're no longer in 2011, we're in 2019. What has really changed? In engineering, a lot of the focus seems to be on quantities of interest. Now I'm not saying that that's exclusive, but I'm saying there's a lot of focus on quantities of interest. And machine learning has moved and been upgraded in status from a perceived enabler to an evangelized enabler. Now, if you want to see what is evangelized, I mean, I work with students, 
that the minute they solve the inverse problem, that's machine learning. The minute they do a regression, that's a machine learning. I mean, you read these irritating papers, at least irritating to me, that if you are solving a system of equation to determine coefficients, well, they tell you, we're learning the coefficients. So the word learning has been degraded to a level that is really substandard with respect to anything. But I'm getting older. I guess I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> now, the German came up with something very interesting, which is Industry 4.0, which is, in a way, another form of digital twin. And the idea is that with all this data-centric work, you can work with data, you can work real-time with data to be able to customize decisions. That's why I said it's ushering the era of customized decisions, where you could decide on maintenance, no longer based on how many miles your car has driven or how many months. It's really customized, it depends on your vehicle, depends on your asset, on your, air gra I mean, on your uh, aircraft. So it is really driven by a digital twin that's going to collect data about, think of health monitoring about the system and based on what's happening, whatever you can infer from that data, which is another topic, you could decide on a scheduled maintenance and this is called predictive maintenance. So this is Industry 4.0 on the ground. This is something that we submitted to DARPA 18 years ago. This slide is 18 years old. And I met last week with the program manager to whom I pitched this at DARPA 18 years ago. He is today at Boeing and he recognized the slide. And this was the idea was that if you have a physical asset, you could build a digital replica. You could tell how old that slide is because look at the course resolution of the CFD mesh. No one would accept such a course resolution today, except perhaps if you're learning something of it. And then you can flow the sensor data, and then you can update the model to the point where at some point you reach a state where in some metric, and you feel free to define any metric you want, better be relevant. In some metric, you are reproducing the state of the aircraft. And then if later on, after that critical time that you have reached where you are starting reproducing the states of the aircraft, if you hit a point or a time interval where you no longer reproduce it, the state of the interval, then you are so confident in your model that you don't question the model. You say something went wrong in the system, it's time to shift it to maintenance. And that's the idea, vulgarized a little bit for uh, scheduled or customized schedule for maintenance. So you could use it also for crisis management. We wanted to pitch it for prognosis. You for predictive maintenance, quality control, warranty optimization. They're all great pictures. The hardest thing is what exactly you're going to monitor and how you're going to infer decisions on these things and are they going to be deterministic or probabilistic. So this is the digital twin for medicine where again the idea is that we in, the me in, in medicine there are tons of papers that find that uh, people say that treatments tend to be you know, universal like uh, there's one treatment, let's say a weight loss program, that there's a formula that you have to you go to follow it. But when people have been saying that it's not effective, but on the other hand, you customize it to a particular individual. So overall, the picture is the same, but the details vary. Then you can achieve a better efficiency in terms of people who not gain weight a few years later. In this case, here is three years later. So, and then you have a digital twin to track and follow the patients so that you have a customized uh, medicine here. Now, here is early practice. So, this is last June from ANSYS and SAP. I mean, you would think what ANSYS, which is a physics-based software, probably the biggest today, not sure, but it seems to me like they are the biggest, and SAP, which lives in totally different world, what would they have in common? And uh, I called and I asked, and I know that I am on video. 
And somebody told me, well, I mean, you'll be surprised. SAP has figured it out all. They can do all these things. They can predict this, predict that. I said, hold on a second. I'm more than happy believing all this. But if they can do it all, why are they working with you at Ansys? So something is not very kosher in that story. But I give them kudos that they are propagating, you know, pushing forward with this technology. And uh, I don't know exactly how they do it. I have some ideas, but there is a lot of interest in the people who potential customers tell me that what you monitor, you monitor the quantities of interest that you believe are associated with failure modes that you're familiar with. Now this makes perfect sense, but uh, there are many other ways in machine learning that are far older that have been doing this. And I kind of like them because I learned something about them recently. So you can look at response services, particularly when they are equipped with Gaussian processes. I think you're all familiar with this. And uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms are being proposed, like everywhere for anything, you know, about how you could minimize the uncertainty with respect to your choice of points where you sample the process in order to get the Gaussian process. And when I ask them, do you get something that is really accurate here? I'm talking about engineering. And the answer is, well, anyway, everybody knows that all models are wrong, but some are useful. I've been hearing this for 20 years. And finally, I decided to go and search who said that. And actually, this is statistician, George Box, in 1976, who wrote this. Now, probably this is not a big deal. But what I found very interesting is what he also wrote in that paper, that no one else, I haven't seen anyone quoting it. If you have seen, please raise your hand and tell me. What else, what he also said, a page or a couple of pages later, is that, but then, over-elaboration and over-parameterization is often the mark of mediocrity. <laughs> and that's pretty much how I feel when I see everybody trying to put a non-physics-based something over the parameterized to recover something that is of the sort F equals MA. And if you have not seen it, well, you're living in a much better world than me because I have seen it. I have worked with engineers who are we try to rediscover F equal MA by simply doing that kind of work. So the real question is, how would you pick these quantities of interest? So let me give you an example. One thing that as a community in aircraft we're all interested in is whether you're gonna have a crack and what's gonna happen to that crack. Well, Cracks nucleates at the micro scale, if not lower, at the optimistic scale. What is going to be your quantity of interest? Are you gonna to try to observe something at the micro scale? I mean, most likely you're gonna observe something at the macro scale, but then you have to figure out how to infer it from observations that you would like to do probably in the lab or somewhere on the micro scale. So my point is that there are tons of issues, and but the open dominating example seems to be temperature in engines, because that, there is a technology to measure talents of temperature points and collect the data. That's a good example for which probably that's the way to do it. But I'm a little bit skeptical about whether with quantitative interest you can do everything, unless we're talking really about failure models that experimentally are very well known, everybody believes in, and you have already figured out how to track them and monitor them, but certainly not in general when you're building a new system that you don't even know what the failure model is going to be. It's going to be very hard to go with it. Now, I'm gonna give you one example, besides the fact that it has a cool movie. So JBL came to pay me a visit three years ago to talk to me about this problem. So these are the parachutes that you open up in order to decelerate from Mach 2 to about 10 times lower speed in order to, for two minutes, to reduce uh, the speed of the capsule that contains the rover and then take it up for thrusters and go with two more stages for landing. And as you can see, they were failing all the time. So the design is the same that goes back to Gemini the Viking program, excuse me, the Viking program, 1976. The only thing that has changed is scaling. The, the rovers used to be, you know, this size. Now they are the size of a Mini Cooper, 
and the ones for 10 years from now, they're going to be the size of a mini bus. You need bigger and bigger parachutes. And then people are doing the test from now, and it's showing that something needs to be done. So they said, maybe we can look at computational modeling for trying to see if we can learn something about this. So this is partly for bragging that we can simulate this today. You can see here CFD with AMR, the fluid structure, inflation, parachute opening. And it works pretty well, except that it's pretty slow. And then if we correlate, we have correlated with the help of JPL, uh, between the predicted results and you can see at the left and the curiosity data for the inflation time it matches pretty well and then everybody was happy and then they said okay let's try to understand now why they fail and I said great what is your quantity of interest you want me to look at and they said well how do we know you built the model you should tell us what is the quantity of interest so probably this is where something like machine learning really help is in data mining trying to understand what should we look at and also in a setting rather than just solve the entire problem so that brings me to machine learning and I would like to start with the definition to set a little bit the to set the stage for the rest of the talk now there are days where I when I read papers on machine learning look like it's everything I mean, it's pretty much everything. If you're solving AX equal B, it's machine learning, the minute A is not square. If you're minimizing something, it's machine learning. If you're throwing some, addressing some uncertainty, it's machine learning. I mean, it's becoming a little bit everything. I went to Wikipedia, and I find that actually there is a same definition of what machine learning is. It used computational methods to learn information directly from data without relying on a predetermined equation as a model. I think probably that's the best definition anyone could come with. But I would say that given the context of what I'm going to be talking about, or what I'm already talking about, it's a little bit misleading, not intentionally. I would simply change it to say, it's not without relying on a predetermined equation as a model. It was developed historically for problems for which there is no predetermined equation. And that's what made it so valuable. And that's what made it so, so much impact. That's why it's called artificial intelligence, because there is no model. If we already know what equilibrium is, what Newton's law is, what the second principle of thermodynamics is, why would we want to reinvent it with the data regression, or with clustering, or with anything? It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever to me. Now, if you look at it from an approximation theory, that's a different thing. I'll let the expert decide on this, because you know, we all use uh, approximations, and it's quite possible that one approach for approximating something could be better than another. I mean, that's, uh, but even there, for solving PDEs, there's already so much history, you know, worrying about consistency, stability, I mean, all these things. But again, it's possible that neural network can provide you better shape functions. But I really think that historically, this is what saying. Now, I'm not the only one having a little bit a small dose, a small dose of criticism. This is at NIPS in 2017. I don't know how many of you go to NIPS. So Ali Rahimi, who is at Google, won the Test of Time Award presentation, which is given for, it's an award that is given for some work you have done 10 years ago and have really done some impact. And he quoted one of my colleagues uh, Andrew M. at Stanford say that AI is the new electricity. This is something that Andrew said you know, many years ago. But Ali Rahimi had a different opinion. He said that machine learning has become alchemy. And he said it has become alchemy because everybody is trying to look at it as the tool that's going to solve every problem uh, without necessarily understanding why and how. Now, obviously not everybody agrees with what Rahim said, there were many blogs immediately, but you could see that he was saying it very loudly when many people were believing, you know, but not affording to say it that loudly. Now, let me tell you my experience as a chair of the department. So, we filled a course called Decision Making Under Uncertainty. 
it has a lot of elements of machine learning and it has a lot of elements of Markov processes. It's pretty mathematics, computer science oriented for an engineering course, for an aerospace engineering course. Let me also tell you that our class is typically about, I mean, what I mean, the number of graduate students. We, are, we were only, until recently, until two years ago, we were only a graduate department, and we typically admit 50 people. We, we, we recruit 50 people successfully uh, in a year. And at any point in time, we have about 230, 240 graduate students. Mm -hmm. This is just to give you the reference. So we filled in this course in 2014, and we got 50. And in 2018, we are at 400 which means clearly they cannot be all from the department because even if I counted all generations in that department, I mean, we're only 200 something, but we have 400 students who are interested in tech. <coughs> we're great. Then if you go to CS229, now this is called machine learning. It has an enrollment now that is higher than 700 in a school of engineering that has 3,500 graduate students. And that's CS229 is the graduate version. Clearly, it's valued. There is, it's an interesting topic. But there is no doubt that there is the perception that when you put it on your CV in the Bay Area, you're going to get a much better uh, marketing. Your, your CV is going to do a much better marketing job for you. I have, I have little doubt about that and probably for good reasons. The problem I have is with this, is that typical of many graduate courses, faculty like to give a final as a take-home project. And then what they do, the people who teach this course, because there are many when you have 700 students, they know that they're catering to many departments from all over, particularly from engineering, they send emails to the faculty, to simple people like me, to tell them, could you please help us come up with some projects where the students can work on machine learning? And one day I took issue with this is say, uh, what are we teaching them? I mean, are we teaching them that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Why the project isn't explore whether there is a need for it in your problem rather than go, you know, and hit? So, Maybe it's a little bit an overreaction, but there is certainly some truth to it. I'm working now with students, as I told you, that if they put a data fitting, they say I'm learning the coefficient. There are people who think they are learning fundamental constitutive equations in solid mechanics because they're fitting a stress-strain curve. Never have heard about contravariant and covariant quantities. Never have heard about conjugate pairs to maintain energy. I mean. So it's just becoming that everything is becoming a black box. And that, I think, is a problem, unless I am so conservative and old-minded that I'm irrelevant, as the future will tell us. But here is what we can see. Fixations and barriers. So machine learning has done tremendous success, something that is remarkable. I don't know how many of you use Alexa. I find it incredibly enjoyable. <laughs> For benchmark problems on reading comprehension, speech recognition, and face recognition. I mean, kudos, I'll even kneel there. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal achievement that has been done. But these are problems where you may not agree with the details, but let's look at them as an overhaul. You have large amounts of data that are really free. They are free for charge to the analyst. The analyst never paid for this data. When you go, you're sick, you go to the hospital, and the hospital collects data on you. When the machine learning analyst comes in, that data is available. The concept of error and inaccuracy, and I'm sorry I missed your talk, so I'm sure that if you're doing machine learning for PDEs, you'll have to define error and accuracy. But when you're talking about reading comprehension, speech recognition, face recognition, the concept of error or accuracy is not the same as the concept of error or accuracy that we do in our physics-based modeling and simulation. I mean, we know what an error is and we know what accuracy is. Here we're talking about false positives, here we're talking about being able to jump very fast for useful, you know, logistic 
the regression answers, it's a yes or a no, the system fails, or not. I mean, they're all very useful. All I'm stressing is that it's not the same. And then, the concept of prediction is really more qualitative than quantitative. I mean, have you recognized the face? Yes or no? No one's going to ask you, did you recognize it to 99.96? Or did you recognize it to 99.01? Uh, try to sell a simulation or a computational technology if you don't achieve a certain predetermined level of accuracy with respect to experiments. And even when you do it, they'll tell you, well, we have the experiment. Why should we use your stuff anyway? So it's, it's really two different words. If you come to physical systems, well, there are lots of different physical systems, but many that I am interested in, there are only small amounts of data that are available. If you're an aerospace engineer and you want to work on hypersonic systems, well, you'll be lucky if your entire career you can put your hands on a couple of bits of data. There's not that much. We don't do that many of them. They're very complicated. They're very, very difficult. And they're very expensive. And you have to pay for them. And every time the funding agency funds computational works, they have to fund also experimental work to provide a forum for doing verification and validation. And then the concept of prediction is very quantitative. It's not about false positive. It's really about what can you reproduce with respect to experiment. So this brings me to a little test here. So if we're going to work with limited amount of data, and we're talking data for the moment, and suppose I give you a function f that I know in two points, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, and we don't have time, so I'll give you the reason. So if I tell you, well, I mean, can you predict that function at an intermediate point mu3? I mean, if that's the only thing we know and we're not trying to be overly smart, we do a linear regression and say that's what it is. And then if I tell you, well, somebody called me to tell me that among the infinite number of circles that pass through these two points, there is one particular circle, this one, that go through these two points. Would you like to reassess your evaluation of f of mu3. And typically, I get the form of an answer. Well, maybe this one or that one. No one anymore would like to stick with the linear approximation. And uh, the real issue here is not whether it is the point on the straight line, the one on the upper circle, the lower circle. The real question is, who is going to call me to tell me that there is this circle that is of great interest that I should pay attention to? And that's the model. And that's what brings us to physics in form. If I know something about the physics that govern this function f, it will be really not that clever not to use it. I have listened to models, machine learning based data driven models designed to take off an aircraft where the conclusion was that we have so many parameters that you know the curse of the rationality is pretty hard to achieve the results in any meaningful real time. And then I see in it as models the height, the velocity, the acceleration. Well the acceleration is a derivative of the velocity, but since you can learn it, why Bottom to write it. The forces, the lifts, well, F equal MA. I mean, so, and I'm in front of the video. I'm not exaggerating anything. I can pull these slides and can send it to you. So, so that's when it comes to machine learning. So, this is an example, and we're going to come closer to where I want to come. So, this is, this is a 15, I don't know, 2008, an 11-year-old exercise we did. We're predicting the flutter of aircraft. So you have the aerodynamic that you cannot see here because it will mess up the picture. You have the structural vibration of the wing and you have fluid, the fuel inside that is sloshing. And we're trying to compute the flutter speed index, which means for which quantity of fuel at which speed the system becomes unstable. And then you have to make sure that you eliminate that by design. And we have here the tool at the left. It doesn't matter how the, so this truth here has been obtained with a highly sophisticated computational model. So it gives you the FSI as a function of the fill level in the Mach number. But we have a database 
This database is nothing else than the extraction of what you see here, but the extraction of some very specific point, and it was extracted in such a way that there is no way you can recover this secondary peak here, and this is not pretty smooth. So if you do a cubic regression, well, you do a little bit okay here, but as you can see, you cannot recover what is here because you have no information about what is there. And if you extrapolate, you are stable. But then, if we do an interpolation on the manifold, amazingly, you get everything you want. And that's linear, that's not even cubic. Now, of course, the real question is, what is that manifold? Well, guess what? That manifold is a model that you have used your engineering and your knowledge about the physics to model the whole process. And then you inform it by this database because we all know that all models are wrong but some are useful. And then we use the data to correct it and as a result, you can obtain things that you would have considered that extrapolation but once you have a model, it's no longer an extrapolation because it's a model that's generating them, it's a prediction. So, this brings us now to an alternative vision for digital twins that is not necessarily driven by, uh, uh, by uh, standard machine learning in the sense of neural network, or not even driven by quantities of interest, but it's going to bring me to model reduction. And uh, I'll get there pretty quickly because that's what's going to give me speed. And then my model will never be perfect, it'll have uncertainties. So if I wanted to use it for a digital twin, I need to account for these uncertainties in a way that really is effective. So this is going to bring me to probabilistic modeling, and that's what is the probabilistic learning in the title. And then data is what's going to make this whole thing close to get a digital twin, in the sense that I need to keep updating the model until it becomes perfect by any metric that you decide to call perfect to reproduce the data so that when you stop reproducing it, you can uh, have a customized decision. Now, where is machine learning going to be? Well, amazingly, you're going to find that even none of them is really driven by machine learning. Every one of them is filler is machine learning, except that they were never called machine learning because not everybody who was solving an optimization problem would call things machine learning in those days. So, in this one slide, I learned something from Nathan in one of your talks that you can summarize model reduction in one slide. <laughs> so, I have done exactly this, model reduction in one slide, and this is what it is. You start by something that is different than elsewhere. You pick a model you believe in, and let's put it in the fridge for the moment. Let's start from here. First, we formulate the hypothesis. We're going to formulate the hypothesis that my quantity of interest, my field, my solution, my whatever you're looking at, can be modeled with an affine sub in an affine subspace with a reduced basis. Well, that's pretty much what you do in the first step of machine learning when you say that I'm going to model whatever I'm interested in a <coughs> sigmoid function. As a matter of fact, people next to my door tell me that now they're moving from sigmoid functions to affine functions because they figure out that, you know, they run faster. Well, then we're becoming closer and closer friends here. <laughs> the other thing is that we can be smart and saying that I don't necessarily want to have all these layers of encoders, perceptrons, and all the stuff. There are probably other approaches. I don't know if they are better or not, but there have been other approaches to build that reduced basis. But clearly it comes from training, from things that are very well known in engineering, known as design of experiments. Well, that's the same training that you see in machine learning. Then you have to determine to formulate the loss function. Well, my loss function is to say that whatever approximation I'm going to get out of this assumption, it better satisfy my model because I wanted to satisfy the physics. So when I plug this assumption with the training for the reduced spaces to get my shapes into that residual and say I want to minimize it, well, I have completed the cycle of a machine learning with one difference. I have a physics model that is defining the loss function instead of 
defining a loss function based on purely data concepts of minimizing false positives or minimizing things of that sort. So that gives you a physics-based machine learning approach. And actually, it has a predetermined equation because I picked my model at the beginning. And this model could be anything that you believe in. And what you're gaining out of this is something to be able to go faster, the speed. We're not trying to learn anything that the model could not teach us, except perhaps that now, if we have a parametric space mu, we can explore a much larger mu space much faster, and therefore we could learn through things much faster. But fundamentally speaking, we're learning the same thing that R has, but faster, and that's what the idea here is. So, we have been recently interested in saying how we can shift information from model reduction to machine learning for physics-based machine learning, and also the other way, because there are lots of things that if I have time of what people have done in neural network that can you know, go the other way, and the two fields can help each other. So this is something that's pretty old. This is a decade old. This is done by one of my graduate students, uh, actually several of them. <coughs> Uh, one of them is, is in the room here, about the concept of local reduce order basis, which means that now we have shape functions that they are global in a certain sense, but they are local with respect to the manifold of the solution that they're trying to try, but they're still a global in space. So this is a trajectory of a solution of a PDE that the solution is called Y, T is the time, so this is here, you know, is space time, space trajectory for some parameter configuration you want. So mu is the vector and one to say that this is one first try. And I'm digitizing it, which means I'm sampling it. So each one of these triangles could have up to 100 million unknowns. That's your state vector at that point. And then I change mu2, so that's the training, similar to ML. I get a different curve because it's highly nonlinear. I get another one, it's highly nonlinear. And then I just erase everything just to highlight that this is now big data. I have all this data, it is sitting there, and what do you want to do with it? Well, if you observe here, in this region, you have circles, you have triangles, and you have squares, which means that no matter how you change the parameters, the solution has a tendency. And this is not, by the way, manufactured data, that's the true data. The solution has a tendency to go back there. So, in a way, it has some notion of attractors uh, in the chaos theory. But it doesn't go back here necessarily at the same time, given that these are parameterized by time. But this is where you say, okay, that's an ideal problem for classification. So, you can run a classification algorithm. So, this is machine learning now techniques that are being used as part of the solution to identify how many regions are really fundamentally different. And then you can now compress the data in each one of them separately. And now instead of having one global reduced basis, you have a catalog of reduced basis. And you can do things like this. And then when you're solving online the problem, every time you have to be able to identify to which one of these you're closest. And we can do this in real time. And then you, you use the reduced basis that is here. And then you update it when you move on. Now, very recently, I had a very talented graduate student who said, well, we should be able to do the same thing with neural networks. So she came up with a formulation where instead of having a fully connected neural network, you could reproduce the same type of thinking with something that she called a, you know, as a function network and there is a context network which is trying to track the solution of the PDE on the manifold of the solution so that you don't use the full network fully connected everywhere, but you can track it. So this, these are ideas that came from one way to go to the other way, and there are ideas that go one way to the other way. And actually that worked pretty well. Uh, the more important thing is that there are remains two things. Which parameter to sample when you do your training? Remember in machine learning, you have gazillions of data that is sitting here. It's for you to go to train your approach on it, but the data is there. This is a different approach here, where we have to generate the data ourselves. So it's really a design of experiments that is going to ask us which data are you going to generate. But then the far more important question, at the end of the day, we're all solving an optimization problem. Most of the time, if not all the time, it is non-convex. 
And therefore, I would like to know how much data is needed so that I can trust what I'm getting. I mean, if we come from a culture of PDE where we have the concept of mesh refinement and time refinement, and we have theorems that give us error bounds and give us confidence in the result, I mean, I have data here. It's great if it solves a problem that there is no other approach to solve it. But when there are other approaches to solve it, I'd like to know what is specific for any time that's going to have a loss function with a minimization. Because if I can't control the amount of data and understand how much data is needed, some people, probably not all of us, but some people are going to have a hard time you know, believing in this. Who would like to understand I mean, how much data is really needed? Now, one thing that I am not aware of that has been used in the context of machine learning, but I don't know everything. But I know that it's very popular in modern reduction and very popular in simple PCA analysis and everything is the concept of a greedy procedure, where the greedy procedure tells you which data you generate and how much is enough. But again, that makes sense in a context where you're generating the data, not in a context where somebody gives you the data. So these are two different problematic. So if this is my parameter space, and I took one that is two-dimensional simply to illustrate the concept, you start from any initial point, and all what you need is an error indicator, not even an error estimator. And your error indicator is the residual of that, that famous residual, which is the predetermined, the pre the equation-based predetermined model that you believe in, but that you want to improve its quality and its speed. So you can take now this uh, initial point, you can build a ROM here, and then you can generate random points inside the parameter space. You can use the Latin hypercube sampling, you can use factorial design, you can use anything you want. And you can use the error indicator to see where, at which points you're doing the worst, not the best. Because if you're doing the worst, then you don't have much information there. So this is the point where you're doing the worst. You take it, you generate more training, you generate more data here. Until you have converged to a certain designed accuracy, which means you have picked the data you're interested in, so there is no need to come after with something like an active subspace or something to try to reduce the data. We have generated by definition to be reduced. And also, we know that we, we have enough, or if we don't, we don't have enough of it. Now, these are some results that, uh, I saw Kyle this morning. Kyle, are you in the room here? Yeah. So these are the results generated from Kyle, who moved to Boeing, and then from Boeing to Amazon. And uh, so this is a very realistic simulation. This is very something that Boeing, which is next door, is interested in. So you have a transonic flow, you have a CFD model with a scalar MRS turbulence model, you have even a wall function, you have a small dimensional parameter space of four dimension only. And what we're interested in what if scenario. So we're interested in things like if somebody comes and says, well, what would happen if I make this going a little bit longer? So this is like a loop in an optimization. So you would like to be able in the real time to say, well, your drive is gonna move by 10 points. Are you really sure you want to do that? So you want to do these things. So Kyle has trained this. And then you want to make sure that after the training, when you go online, everything goes pretty fast. So there's the concept of hunter reduction. And it doesn't matter. You don't need much background. Here's what's happening. You know that when you compute the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx, What's the best technique you know for approximating that integral? Quadrature rule, I agree. But if you apply a quadrature rule, it means that you really don't need to know the knowledge of f in the entire interval 0, 1. You only need to know it at a few points. And then the question becomes, if I have a huge CFD domain around this aircraft, can I really compute what I'm interested in without having to use every one of these grid points? So that's one way to do hyper reduction. And you can do this when you're working with reduced quantities because they are of lower dimension than high dimensional quantities. And then this is what hyper reduction is. It's saying that if you're trying to compute the projection of your model on a reduced basis, you can do it by some quadrature rule. 
and you get the coefficients of the quartz rule and the subset of the elements that you see here, essentially by doing machine learning, by building loss function, minimizing that loss function, and training over a large set of functions to be able to determine the subset on which you're going to compute your flow and the weights to be able to reconstruct your flow based only from this. And that was before the days where people were talking about physics-based machine learning. So same concept. So this is a minimization problem by a congregate gradient of suits, and you can get the same thing. Now, so this is an example of how predictive this can be. So the reduced order <coughs> model can be built in two hours on 24,000 cores. This is now running on a laptop in less than three minutes at a queer but uh, unsampled point. And then this is the kind of accuracy that you can get. So the physics are respected, and that's what you would expect. Now, I have to say that I have a good friend to whom I have a lot of respect, George Kanyadakis, who has been showing how you can use, like presumably many other people, neural network shape functions to solve PDEs. And then at the end of the paper, there is a paragraph that explains how you make them physics based. What he said, you put them into the residual, you minimize, and you get the coefficient. So I sent him an email saying, great, that's called quantum reduction. So we're essentially rediscovering you know, the same thing. So I think that there are different things that can be done with this. So this is more example to show you that it works also in solid mechanics. This is for even contact. And you can get speed ups of factors of 2 million, but it took a decade to get this you know, to work. So here we went from a high dimensional model of 2 million to a model for dimension 31 that reproduces pretty much, you can see the same accuracy that you want for some difficult problem. And then comes the problem of mother form uncertainty, which is really going to bring us to the crux of the digital twin. Is that now we know how to compute fast. Well, it's not going to be very predictive because there are uncertainties. That's how we explain it. Now, there are all kinds of uncertainties, but I like to focus on some. So, if you have an aircraft that is like this, there are still tons, 99% of the papers, and you know, please check it if you think I'm exaggerating anything. There's 99% of the paper that look at the parameters of something like this and claim that the uncertainties are in the parameters, so you randomize the parameters, and then you track the uncertainties. Well, if you are in charge of building a finite element model of something that is that complex, if you want to go from this to this, you realize that before you even worry about the parameters, whether you know the young modulus of the aluminum correctly, or whether you know the parameters, there are so many decisions you have to make about what to drop, and what to include, about what are the bounding conditions between various elements of the transmission conditions. I mean, there are, whether there is a free play that is important or not, whether are we going to get into the elastoplastic regime or this is going to remain. I mean, there are so many decisions that we have to make that by the end of the day, it's safe to assume that some of them are not going to be right. And these are the uncertainties that we really have to go on. And in that case, I'm going to show you with a simple picture why I don't believe that randomizing the parameters, which is the dominant approach, really helps much. So let's suppose that I'm solving as a dot that is missing, u dot equal f of u here, and I have my parameters. And I even split the parameters to be very careful between something that is uncertain and some that are perfect that have no uncertainties. And then I have my experimental data that is here. Let's do things deterministically. Let me keep varying this parameter mu, and when I vary it, I generate this subspace of the solution. So you can see that it's not going to find u experimental. Well, so if I go now and make this random, well, it's not going to find it either. It's going to rediscover essentially the same subspace with only one more information in each case, and you want into probability, there's going to be this one rather than that one. But it's not going to give you anything else. So what we have a couple years ago came up with is an approach where we said, let's randomize the subspace in which we're computing the solution. Well, for two reasons. One is that I will never violate the physics. 
because there is no policeman or policewoman that I know that can come and tell me why I picked that shape function versus that other shape function. Well, if you start by randomizing the parameters and you find that you get a much better result if your parameter means value is this, but you can go to the lab and remeasure that parameter and find that it's not this, essentially you got the least square solution here that is just a convoluted form for multiple things that gives you the right answer, but is it really the right answer? So here we're changing the subspace in which we're computing the solution. And by changing the subspace, by running the subspace, I can increase the scope of my solution without increasing its dimension. I mean, that's, that's really the trick. But there will be a computational cost because cost can grow even with, for a constant dimension depends on the process. So that's the idea that you see, which means essentially if we're working with a re reduced basis or with ROMs, because we need ROMs anyway to be able to do the Monte Carlo simulation pretty fast, so the idea is to randomize the basis, which means that now we're working with a family of bases instead of working with only one basis. And we have a whole theory about how to do this. So we have to satisfy that this basis, when it's randomized, it remains a basis. So it, we enforce something slightly stronger, which is orthogonality. So we're going to randomize this basis on a manifold. Uh, we're going to you know, do it on the Schleifel manifold. And in order to be efficient, and this comes another machine learning problem, we're going to hyperparameterize that thing. So we're not going to randomize every coefficient of that basis because the problem becomes untrackable. What we're going to do is to simply say that if this is the manifold on which sits the reduced basis that is deterministic, this is typically differentiable, it's Riemannian, this is the tangent space. I start from some set of hyperparameters, and we have a theory to be able to decide how big is the size of this factor of hyperparameters. So these are random. I can use them to control the randomness of an arbitrary matrix U, just like you use control points for a spline to be able to generate the spline. And then I do some simple transformation of U that is written here that automatically makes U sits in the tangent plane to that manifold. And then I do a polar decomposition to bring this matrix to the manifold. And now I have built something that satisfies the physics that I want while still randomizing the basis. So now I have a stochastic model, and uh, let me skip the mathematical details. And this is now where comes another learning process. Again, learning by the standards of vocabulary today. So now I have a model that has a reduced basis that is stochastic. So it's going to give me families of solution. I can do real-time Monte Carlo simulations. So for a given alpha, if I knew the alpha is going to generate to me stochastic solution, they're going to have a mean, they're going to have an average, uh, a mean, and they're going to have standard deviation. They're going to have many moments. And then I can go to my data. If my data is deterministic, assuming we have data that is available, then its mean is itself, its standard deviation, I could de de design a mock-up one. <laughs> and then if uh, it's statistic, I have, it has its own statistics. Then I'm going to formulate a Hopf's function that says that my alpha is such that the mean and the standard deviation of my stochastic reduced order model which means the mean and the standard deviation of the solution produced by my model have to match the ones that are available in the data. So I have to solve this optimization problem. And here we have been looking at even machine learning ways to solve this, like using diffusion maps with probabilistic learning or using simple stochastic uh, gradient uh, and descent methods. But the point is that once you determine alpha, you have a random matrix B that is whose randomness is controlled by alpha. That will give you now a family of solution U, and then you have built another physics-based machine learning approach to be able to extract information from data and insert it into the model because we have inserted it into the reduced basis that is built to build the model. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a wind that 
was built at the University of Minnesota. This is known as the MAE Wing 1. Now we are generation MAE Wing 2. And then uh, there were two teams that were asked to really identify the natural frequencies of this aircraft so that you can build a controller to fly it. And then in each case, so team one is Skull, team two is Haiti, and for each mode, so this is an eigenvalue, general eigenvalue problem for those of you who are not familiar, they were given two different approaches, two different methods, the same packages for both of them, to use to determine the natural frequencies and the eigenvectors. Now here's what is amazing. It's supposed to be the same aircraft. We all know that in practice, it cannot be exactly the same because you built it twice but it's supposed to be overall the same. These are the same methods used by both teams. So you can see that for the first frequency, what well, everybody found more or less the same thing. For the second frequency, the second team could not identify it. For the third frequency, only the second team who was not able to identify the second was able to identify the first. Here, everybody got more or less the same thing. Fifth frequency, everybody missed everything. For the sixth frequency, the differences are over 25%. I mean, already if you have more than 5% discrepancy, you can't build a controller. So at 25%, it's just you don't know which one to believe. So when people say data is more important than model, I mean, maybe that's a counterexample. But as the French say, counterexample shows you that there is a rule. So, and then, so. We built a simple finite element model and look at all these sources of uncertainty. We built it as a stick model, which means only with beams and bars. This is made out of composite, so we have homogenized the composite. Mass distribution, no one had time to do the mass distribution. It was lumped. Took the total mass, lumped it at various points. And there is damping, but no one has an idea of what is damping, so it is undamped. So we built all these. And then we build them, so we know we're going to have uncertainties. And then we put, and we're going to use now the data that has been measured, with the caveat that even the people among themselves don't agree on the data. And this is the result that we get. So the black dots are the points where you have the data. And you can see that for some frequencies, we have two points. They could be close, or they could be pretty far apart. Now, the deterministic model, which is a diamond in gold, occasionally matches the data, and then most of the time, it really doesn't match it, and it, or it could be close to one, perhaps it's luck, very far from the other, so it's very difficult. But if you look at the stochastic model that has extracted information from this data to reshape its own basis, so that's what come to the digital twin concept that has been updated you can see that in all cases, the range, the interval that it gives you for a, a confidence set at 0.98, which means at 98%, in all the cases, it brackets you know, the experimental data, so which means it has learned from it, and now you can trust it for the health monitoring of this aircraft. And this is my last example, because my time is up. So this is a MEMS device, for which we also have data. And then, again, you do the model, you do everything. And then you have the experimental data, you have the reduced order model data, deterministic, you have the stochastic one. And you can see that in all cases, the stochastic one, which has the upper bound in green and the lower bound in green, and then use yellow to highlight the region, it's always bracketing the experimental data. So once you have achieved this result, for a large dimensional parameter, dimensional space, then you have your thing that is modeled, and then you can use it for predictive maintenance. Now, that's my concluding slide. So, I've been thinking about what is the really usefulness for all this. So, many of us, so this is my view of the pyramid of modeling and simulation. I view it as a pyramid with three layers. So, the bottom layer, is modeling and simulation for prediction. I mean quantitative prediction. So that's going to be physics space. But then there is a lot of interest at this top pyramid that is narrower, 
like any type of educator. And something known as modeling and simulation for enterprise decision making. That's the course that Michael Kokendorfer is teaching. You want to be able to make decisions on something. So these ones are physics based. This is where everybody talks about data analytics and everything that you want. Now, if we're looking at innovating in aircraft or trying to optimize the bottom line of a corporation, the physics-based people are all debating over the performance of an aircraft in terms of, we all understand, drag, skin friction coefficients, turbulence, laminar flow. But the people who are making the decisions live in a different world. They only care about one thing. There's only one optimization function. It's called the cost function. <laughs> that's, that's the one that really matters. And so they're looking for models. They're looking for data analytics-based models. In the military world, what they're talking about is what they call the campaign level simulations, which means no one is interested in what is the performance of an F-18 or an F-32, 35, or an F-22. But like if you were <coughs> trying to strategize, is how many of them would you use knowing that your enemy has this and that? Now, at the bottom, all these things can be traced to the physics because these are physical systems. But no one is interested in going to that level. So I really find that this missing tier that we see here, this is where physics informed machine learning could come with. Not necessarily to build and use all the models, even though that would be great, but to do something that we still haven't figured out how to do, and maybe there are people who have figured out, is more to do data mining of deciding which information should I take out of all this physics-based simulation, and how can I connect them to the other? And I think the digital twin has been a good exercise to train us into this thinking of how you can extract data from somewhere and build it to go on. But I think that this is really what is uh, <coughs> needed, and probably is going to be femur-based if we care about a model. And if it's, you know, if we think that we can control everything with a quality of interest, then it would be that got in the next phase too. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So we have time for a couple of questions from the audience for coffee. Okay, Charles. So there's always a tension between general methods you apply to everything and domain specifics that require special treatment. And it looks like this where is this falling? So a lot of these, it looks like. Well, I'm, gonna, gonna give you the, I'm going to give you the lawyer's answer. This is for a family of problems. <laughs> this is for physics-based problems. This is for problems where failure modes are not known a priori. I do not know which quantity of interest I should be monitoring. I gave you a good example that if I'm interested in health monitoring of an aircraft, and cracks is the first thing that comes to mind. You're gonna be measuring in real time when an aircraft is flying, your sensors are going to be measured quantities at the macro scale, most likely, but failure nucleates at the micro scale. So how do you connect between the two? If you're putting out a new system that you have built, you don't know yet the failure modes, so you cannot use quantities of interest. So all these families of problems where you still need a model, I believe that that's one approach that is reasonable for that. And where machine learning techniques here have been used is not to teach us something about the physics. It's to teach us how to build an alternative model that is much faster once we have invested in training. So it is really not to teach us anything. What we have learned is how to build a better model once we have generated training data. So. What kind of problems? These are the kind of problems for which you don't have data, you have to generate the data yourself, whether it's experimental or numerical. And there are tons of problems like that, but there are many problems which are not like that. Today, engines on an aircraft are instrumented with up to 4,000 sensors that can generate lots of temperature. I am sure that there are failure modes on engines that can be tracked by temperature at a few points. 
But I mean, an aircraft is a multidisciplinary system that has millions of different pieces and devices in it. Not everything is eternal from And these won't necessarily give me a crystal clear idea of what's happening with respect to cracks. So I hope I answered your question. But it's, it's really for all these problems that are governed by physics, for which there are PDEs that are not perfect, but they're not really questionable. They may have elements in them, like a turbulence model, whether it's questionable or not. So, but no one is going to re-question, you know, the second principle of thermodynamics or Newton's law, at least in my world. Any other questions? Yes. So you have a, an opportunity to push your mind onto at least the uh, graduates or undergraduates who are in that class. Um, given, you know, what you're saying, how would you, you or whoever's teaching in the department, teach that class as opposed to how someone in the computer science department would teach a class with the same title? Which class? The um, real-time automated decision-making, the AA the one class, the one with 400 people. Yes. For the moment, it's taught by somebody that I have the utmost respect for, who uses an approach that is halfway in between. He uses Markov processes, so it's not purely heuristical. Tries to get a little bit informed by the physics of the problem, but the class gives examples, and, and, and uh, I hope my answer is going to be clear, from problems where the models are not that complicated, which means the PDE by definition is low dimensional. So let's say they are rigid body, or the problem of collisions between the aircraft, if you want to write a model for the collision, you won't end up with something you know, like the PDEs you work with. So the real answer is, I don't know how to do it. I'm still trying to figure out. But when I figure out how to do it, I will offer a class that will do exactly that. But I don't know how to do it. And probably I am admitting that it's easier to criticize than to do something better. But I think. We start by first realizing that that's not the best thing to do. But we have, I agree, to continue to figure out how to do a better one. And I don't have an answer right now. And part of it, and I'll stop here, is that the entry level, if you wanted to teach a lot of these things, I mean, in a class, I mean, the bar becomes so high for people to, to walk in and take that class. They would need to know something about, I mean, lots of things. They need to know about PDEs, they need to know about model reduction, they would need to know about uh, Randomization, it's about QQ. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not clear to me how I put this in a class. And, but the day I will figure out how to do it, I'll, I'll offer that class. And if you want to help me, that'd be great. Yeah, we've thought about similar yes. things, and it's, it's tricky, but yes. I mean, clearly, what's the minimalist you need? But even the mo mental model, I tell you what, physical system is at this and, point. And I'm really serious it. about it. That's the best topic for an ERC for NSF. Because everybody is banking on these advances in the Bay Area and, and the success of machine learning. And everybody would like to see how this can be transported to other problems. I know one thing. If it is transportable, it's not going to be simply by a hammer that makes everything look at night. It's simply by getting inspiration from there and getting some good concept and migrating them. And maybe migrating concepts also the other way to get something. And that's what I think is really worthwhile a big effort, rather than simply downloading TensorFlow or PyTorch and you know generating training data. And it, I mean, but my own students are doing this right now, and it just drives me nuts. Because if I don't help them, they tell me that I'm very selfish, I am obtuse, and only my opinion counts. <laughs> and if I do what they want me to do, I feel like it's silly. So, so it's, it's really a hard problem to be in. I'm sorry, I'm not mad that answer. All right, well, so uh, in the interest of getting some coffee, let's thank Charbel again.